let's go on to the the Russia situation. Now, th- there's a couple of things that I wanted to bring up on this program. Uh, you did an interview with Redacted, um, uh, and where you said that the U.S. policy in the Middle East could leave Israel with nothing. So I want to redra- address that. And the other one that uh, caught my eye was uh, Russia is still under sanctions, but its economy has not collapsed. Uh, from some of the videos, it seems like Russian lives are largely unaffected. Uh, what do you th- what do you think is the point of sanctions if they're effective or a more uh, a detriment to the other people's economies? Well, let me take the second one first on sure, sanctions because that's very important. Uh, Sanctions have become uh, an expression of, quote unquote, moral outrage in the United States. Any country, any nation state, anywhere that uh, uh, dares to contradict us, who adopts a policy stance that we don't like, uh, is immediately targeted for some sort of economic sanction. Now, these economic sanctions 20, 30, 40 years ago were far more effective than they are today because 20, 30, 40 years ago, the world was different. And we controlled the financial system, the SWIFT payment system, all of these things. If you didn't do business with us, well, then we could bar you from access to things at the World Bank. I mean, we could just go down the whole list of institutions that you couldn't couldn't access or reach. Well, the world has changed. Many of the countries that were formerly weak are now very strong. And the interesting part about us is that we are probably weaker now than we have been in the last 40 years. We haven't been this weak militarily or economically since 1974. And some of your audience will remember that we were so weak economically, we really faced a potential economic catastrophe. That's one of the reasons we came off the gold standard. Uh, We had put ourselves deeply into debt over the Vietnam War, which, of course, was another fiasco, unnecessary catastrophe we visited on ourselves. And at the same time, we frittered away enormous military power and capability in Vietnam, driving out lots of good human capital, people that would have otherwise stayed because they realized this war makes no sense and it's fundamentally wrong, not just strategically, but also morally. We're back there again, only this time there's no gold standard to come off. And uh, China has been quietly shedding control or ownership of uh, U.S. Treasuries. So of the Japanese, so of the Saudis. I think the game is up. I think people realize that we're not going to be able to behave in the future the way we have in the past because we're going to be broke. Of course, the response to that is, oh, we've never defaulted. But they've never looked at our history. We defaulted twice in 32 and again in 34. We called it restructuring the debt. But of course, to restructure your debt, you have to cut spending. Or your you know, your providers, if you will, will not support you. The people that uh, you owe money are going to say, well, if you don't show any evidence for streamlining your budgets and behaving differently, why should we sustain you? And we've showed no willingness under any circumstances to cut anything. A roughly $4.5 trillion every year goes into Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security, along with a host of maybe 2,000 other redistribution programs designed to essentially keep people voting for you, to put it bluntly. And then you have a trillion that is lost every year on defense and the intelligence communities. We can't go on like this. You can't borrow for that in perpetuity. And and you, if you listen carefully to the people in the financial system, they're, they're saying that. But it's one of these things where we've done it so long, we've gotten away for the, with it for so long, surely we can keep it up. So until the whole thing collapses, no one will believe that. So that's, that is a huge problem. And nothing anybody overseas does is going to fix that. In other words, we're going to have to face the music on our own our own uh, imprudent and lackadaisical approach to finance. We, The government is going to eventually announce that it can no longer finance itself. When that happens, you've got a national crisis. It's almost impossible to find out a casualty count um, from this latest war here with um, the Russians and the Ukrainians. We're hearing as low figures as only 60,000 Ukrainians have died to as many <laughs> as a half a million um, 
I guess, why are we not able to get an accurate count? And maybe with, I mean, your amazing uh, uh, academics and your experience, you know uh, the collateral damage in war here. Uh, can you kind of give us maybe your calculation on maybe how many casualties both sides uh, have suffered? Well, when the, <clears throat> when the truth is ugly, only a lie can be beautiful. Remember mm -hmm. that. If you go back to World War II, the Soviets lied about their losses. We now have very, very concrete evidence from the NKVD archives before they were closed that uh, the Soviet Union lost uh, 39,900,000 lives. And we were told for years 20 million. Then the number was advanced to 27 million. Then the number went up to 32 million and then everybody stopped talking because to admit those kinds of losses uh, puts the lie to the greatness of Soviet military power and the failure and, and miserable performance of the Germans. Mm -hmm. Because we know what the Germans lost. That's six million, uh, of which half were lost on the Eastern Front. Now, of the 39 million, you're talking probably 15 million Soviet soldiers. That doesn't include the one million Soviet soldiers executed by Stalin and the NKVD for refusing to fight the Germans. I mean, they're, they're, these kinds of things are very, very damning. No one wants to go there. In fact, in Russia, they passed a law. So you can't discuss this anymore publicly. And you cannot criticize the conduct of the war because it was so alarming. Well, you have a similar situation right now. We're fairly confident, of, uh, I go beyond fairly, I'd say very confident that at least 500,000 Ukrainian soldiers have been killed since this war began. Now that's that's an enormous figure, but you've got to look at the kind of warfare that's being waged. We trained and prepared, organized and equipped for many years, the Ukrainians to fight the Russians. We essentially thought we were building an instrument for offensive operations that could attack Russia and quote unquote, retake control of Crimea. That army was then decimated within the space of about four to five months by the advancing Russians who fought very differently, whose forces were adapted and reorganized and re-equipped for a new kind of warfare. Now, the Russian losses, we're not sure how many million or how many hundreds of thousands or thousands of, of Russians have been killed. I think somewhere it's between 50 and 80,000 Russians have undoubtedly been killed. And how many more were wounded? I don't know, but I do know that most of the wounded in most cases returned to duty. In other words, they showed up again. They came back to the fight. In Ukraine's case, almost no one has returned to the fight. The losses have been so severe and the wounds are so severe and the lack of evacuation capability and medical support has been so acute that the survival rate has been very, very low. I mean, if imagine you're a Ukrainian soldier or officer and you've been wounded you were wounded, say, in February or March. And the only way you could get off the battlefield to get real medical care was to bribe the ambulance drivers to take you. Wow. This this is this is beyond people's imagination. Imagine that your battalion commanders are keeping the names of all the soldiers who were killed in their units uh, off the uh, official or kept them on the official rolls so they could collect the income from the dead for their own purposes, thereby preventing the widows uh, and the orphans of these soldiers from getting anything. Uh, the, the corruption in Ukraine is staggering beyond anybody's comprehension, and there, people are now admitting it. So that war is lost. That's over. Uh, there are a few Ukrainians that are still putting up a fight, and they are being annihilated as we sit here and discuss it in this place called Avdivka, uh, that has turned into Bakhmut, I guess, on steroids. So the, the war is is grinding to a slow and ponderous halt. And I think Mr. Putin is close to the point of giving up on the possibility that anyone with moral courage will rise to the occasion in Europe and, and offer to cooperate and end the war. Because from the very beginning, it's hard for people to understand this in the West, but Mr. Putin has not been interested in killing large numbers of fellow Orthodox Slavs. He has never wanted that. He has never aspired to rule anyone in Western Ukraine, Poland, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, 
Romania, Bulgaria, anywhere. He wants he wants to get back to normalcy. He wants to do business. There will be no Russian assault on Eastern Europe, but he's going to have to march to the Dnieper, and he's going to eventually take a hand in in somehow or another restoring some measure of civility to uh, Western Ukraine if he's left no choice. But he'd rather not. I don't know what, what we're going to do because we're facing a looming bankruptcy. How we're going to finance anything in Western Ukraine is another question. But the bottom line is that's over. We've lost. When I say we, I'm talking about the fools in Washington who made all of these ridiculous assumptions about Russia, that Russia was weak, that its military was incapable, that it could not sustain itself. By the way, these are the things that we continue to say now about Israel's opponents. And my point is, if you actually care about the survival of the state of Israel, you have to recognize that the Middle East has actually changed over the last 50 years, and that states like Iran and Turkey are infinitely more powerful, capable, and potent than they've ever been before. And you cannot ignore hundreds of millions of Muslim Arabs and their rage. If you do, eventually this will explode in your face and Israel will be lucky to survive. No one wants to go there. Everyone who takes the position of that's impossible. And again, we have a habit in Washington of believing it's still 1991. Desert Storm ended last week, and we're the great ones. We're the invincible and vulnerable force in the world. We're the indispensable nation. None of that is accurate. Where can people find you on social media space? What's the best place? Well, one place, one place you could go is uh, you can go to ourcountryourchoice.com. And the second thing uh, is to, you know, just Google my name. All right. Uh, really appreciate it. Have a, have a great day, okay? And thank you so thank much you. for the interview. I really appreciate it. Hey, super. Thanks very much.